Okay, it's six oh one, and we have a quorum of cab members here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, the meeting is recorded, so everyone knows. Set it over here. Okay, I'm Barb Boxer, and I've corresponded with all of you guys in the mail. So thanks for coming to the meeting tonight. Um, we do have quite a bit to cover, so we're just going to jump right into it. Um, I believe we're going to start with uh, introductions. the presentations. Um, we are going to discuss CAB sort of step at the end of the meeting. Take the presentations out of the way first and talk about things specific to this CAB. So East Grand Avenue is first. Now, would you guys like the lights off to see that a little better or not? It's all up to you guys. I'm going to try it out and see. Does that help? It is a little easier. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, again, my name is my name is Tom Titus. Um, I'm the actually the premier projects unit manager. I'm filling in for Mary, who's out on uh, extended leave. She should be back in October. She's the actual PM. Uh, next slide. So we're just going to go over real quick the uh, the wharf process, and then we'll talk more about the site. So uh, the site was listed on the wharf registry in uh, April of 1998. Uh, in uh, June of 2006, we finished the remedial investigation. And basically, what that was was uh, we determined the nature and extent of the contamination at the site. And then in uh, May of 2018, we issued an RI addendum because we did some additional investigation uh, at the site. Um, in June 2020, we issued the feasibility study. And basically, what that did was that evaluated uh, remedial uh, alternatives to clean up the site, remedial technology we could use to clean up the contamination that we found during the remedial investigation. Um, as part of that feasibility study, we identified three alternative uh, remedial technologies that could be used to clean up the site. And uh, in December 2020, uh, we proposed, we developed the proposed remedial action plan, which proposed which alternative we were going to propose to, uh, to clean up the site. We're currently in the uh, record of decision phase, uh, and that's going to uh, be the official uh, document that specifies what we're going to actually do to clean up the site. And uh, we're still, uh, I don't know, hopefully two, three, four months away from issuing the record of decision. Next slide. So here we have a, the area of the site. So the site's enclosed in this black box here. Um, as you can see, uh, it's, it's a little south of the Grand Canal, north of Thomas, uh, west of 27th Avenue, and east of 31st Avenue. Um, you can also see that there's some area of water production wells uh, in the vicinity of the site, not at the site, but in the vicinity, including a couple of SRP wells, uh, Dan and well number one and two, and then the mobile home park, trailer park well, which is up here. We'll talk more about those in a few minutes. Next slide. Um, just the background for the site, the contaminants of concern at the site are chlorinated solvents, including TCE, PC, and 11DC. The source of contamination was from uh, spills and lakes at former facilities that operated at the site. Uh, the current uh, impacted media is groundwater. Um, just to note that the soil was impacted previously, but it was we previously cleaned it up using soil vapor extraction. Uh, potential uh, receptor of the downgrading water supply wells. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Um, so this is the uh, the site right now with the groundwater contamination uh, for the uh, most recent sampling results, which was collected in September 2022. Um, the plume boundary is this black line right here. Uh, as you can see, the wells that we sampled are around the plume, these blue squares, 
and as you can see, the highest concentration uh, at the site is TC at 13.2 parts per billion. Um, PC was also detected above the AWQS at 12 parts per billion, again in the same well. Um, just for reference, the, uh, the aquifer water quality standard, the regular story standard for uh, PC and TC is 5 uh, parts per billion. As you can see, it's, it's above it, but not by a lot. And this, this black line here represents the uh, theoretical edge of where that, uh, the groundwater is impacted above uh, 5 parts per billion or the regulatory standard. Um, groundwater flows to the north, northwest. Uh, depth of groundwater is about 150 feet. And then as you can see, there's a couple of uh, potential uh, drinking water production wells that are uh, up downgrading of the site, a mobile home trailer park well, and an SRP well, which is currently inactive. Um, just to point out that uh, the plume here is the smallest this has ever been. Um, historically, it was a little bit bigger than this. These wells up here have never been impacted, and so the likelihood of them being impacted today with the plume even smaller than it used to be is, is very low. Uh, next slide. So just to kind of reiterate a summary of the, uh, the, ground, the contamination at the site and what's going on, the, the groundwater plume is very small. It's only a couple acres, uh, low concentrations, and uh, the contamination concentrations in those wells are either decreasing or, or remaining stable, so it's not, the plume's not growing, it's shrinking. And then uh, the uh, proposed real action plan, what it proposed was uh, continued groundwater monitoring slash monitor national attenuation to, uh, you know, basically clean up the site. At the concentrations we have of 13.2 parts per billion, uh, there's really not any technology that's cost effective to, to, to clean it up other than just to monitor it until it naturally dissipates. Uh, what we've got planned for the next, and I guess it says 12 to 18 months, but in reality it's probably 6 to 12 months, kind of depending on how things go as they issue the record of decision. Like I said, hopefully we can do that in the next 2 to 3 to 4 months, and then uh, we'll continue doing uh, annual groundwater monitoring. Obviously, once the rod kicks in, we'll follow that, uh, whatever is proposed as a final entity for that, which would be theoretically a continued monitoring on an annual basis. Um, next slide. Um, here's our contact information. If you get home and, or next week or whatever and you have a question, you can reach out to us. You're welcome to call Barb or email us uh, with any questions you have later on. And then the last slide, we have a question slide. So anybody have any questions now? No. <laughs> All right, good. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next is... All right, thank you everyone for uh, coming today. Um, again, I'm Eric Manline, I'm the project manager of the North Canal Plume Wharf site as well as the West Osborne Complex Wharf site, which I'll be uh, speaking on after this presentation. Uh, I won't really go over the, the steps of the wharf process, Tom covered them uh, really well. Um, but this, was, this site was part of a larger preliminary investigation that occurred on, I believe, most if not all the war sites within West Central Phoenix between 1984 and 97. And after uh, this time period is when they started to divide up all the different war sites within West Central Phoenix. Uh, it, it made its fourth listing in 1998. Um, remedial investigation was released in 2017. Um, FS in mid-2020, I want to say it's July, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, actually, it was earlier in 2020. The PRAP was in uh, mid-2020, July. I think the FS was in January. And then right now, um, similar to uh, East Grand Avenue, we're, in, uh, we're at Broad right now. We still haven't issued that yet. We're, we're working on that currently. Um, just as a review where the site's located, um, I actually should have circled this, this part of the war site. This is the West Plume. There's three separate plumes. There's an East Plume, Central Plume, and a West Plume. Um, there's West Grand Avenue, we have uh, West Indian School, and we have the SRP Canal as a reference. 
Uh, it does extend a little bit um, past the SRP canal, the clean boundary that is, um, into the West Osborne complex. Um, but it's everything is north of, uh, of Osborne Road. A um, little background, uh, the COC's contaminants of concern are uh, PCE, TCE, 1,1-DCE, and some chromium, uh, primarily in the central plume. Sources of contamination that are septic tanks, seepage pits, and dry wells associated with most, multiple manufacturing facilities, uh, which operate from the 1950s to the present. Um, the remedial investigation identified a total of 10 uh, sources for the wharf site. And if I'm going too fast, let me know. If you have any questions, just go ahead and uh, ask as I'm going. Um, impacted media, soil, and groundwater with the potential receptors of Salt River Project in the City of Phoenix Municipal Water Supply Wells. Um, we did have uh, some soil vapor that we needed to address in the east part of the plume, and we actually have an SVE system, which I'll talk about um, a little later. But there's no, there really is no, uh, no receptors from soil vapor in the war site, so we've pretty much mitigated that. Um, last milestone here at uh, December of 2020, I'm sorry, I'm getting my two sites mixed up. West Osborne Complex was uh, mid-2020, and then December 2020 was more canal plume. And the next milestone will be the record of decision. Um, I know this is a little busy, I'm sorry I can't uh, present a slide that's more clear, but um, as you can see, it's, it's a pretty complex site. We've got three, uh, three separate plumes. These are the plume boundaries. And then we have all 10 of, uh, of the source areas. Um, 4001 West Indian School Road, Stevens Engineering, Precise uh, Paraflex Companies, former uh, Gillespie exhibits, Southwest Metals, former Osborne Complex, uh, former Pyramid Industries, Magic Metals, former Triad Trucking, and then the HCZ Custom Homes property. This is where we currently have the soil vapor extraction system. And um, just to note, this is um, West Central Phoenix Monitoring Well 213. We've been monitoring this well, um, monitoring the concentrations of PCE. And uh, we've actually seen a decrease in concentrations, which I'll, I'll talk about um, due to the SV system. SV system went in operation in 2019. Um, and uh, right now we're in a pulse operation mode about a little later. Thanks. Uh, for the current remedial activities, um, as I said, the SD system uh, was started up as an early response action in March 2019. Uh, currently, we've, well, up to today, we've removed over 7,000 pounds of volatile organic compounds. So there was a significant amount of, uh, of PC and other volatile organic compounds in the soil that we were able to remediate. We shut the system down in November of 2022 for rebound monitoring. And currently, um, beginning fiscal year 24, which beginning of July, we implemented a pulse operational phase. So what that means is we start the system up for two weeks, operate it, uh, shut it down for another four to six weeks, and then we just monitor what kind of rebound of PCE we're getting in the soil. Uh, we did our, we actually started it up uh, last week, so we're going on our second week of operation. We'll shut it down. Um, we'll do that again in another four to six weeks. We'll do another pulse operation. And then around December, we'll kind of see where we're at. So see if we can, if we need to operate it some more, or if we can look at uh, shutting it down completely or removing as pieces. So a bit of a success story there. Um, so things that we did was that we upgraded the blower for the SB system in the February 2022 to optimize VOC removal from the soil. Um, we're getting to the point, and you'll see in, in a graph in a few slides from now, you'll see that the removal, weight, removal rate decreased significantly. The curve went to what we call asymptotic. So we were hoping we could upgrade the blower, get, uh, get a little more vacuum in the soil, increase the radius of influence, and we could potentially pull more mass out, which we think we did. Um, and since the SD system was started up in 2019, We've seen a major decrease in PCE in an MW213. So it went from 6,000 micrograms per liter, or as we say, parts per billion, down to 78 micrograms per liter. And hopefully we'll see uh, not only there, but further down gradient in the plume. Hopefully we'll see uh, increasing concentrations there as well. Probably take a couple years at least before we see it. It usually takes a little, little bit of time for SVE um, to 
you don't see the effects of the groundwater, but uh, we'll see. And you're currently uh, doing ongoing groundwater monitoring. We do that twice a year, right, semi annual basis, and we'll continue to do so while we're monitoring the site. Uh, this is a layout of the SVE system, um, at the AC Custom Homes property. So we have uh, four extraction wells. We actually added a fourth one. Originally, we had um, SVE 1, 2, and 3. SVE 1 and 2 are the shallower wells. They're uh, screened at around, um, around the 5 to 20 uh, foot range. Uh, SVE 3 has three uh, wells. We have a, a shallow well that goes from around 20 to 30 feet below ground surface. We have one that runs from around 55 to 60. And then the deep one goes from around 118 to, to 130. Uh, SV4, where there's two acid wells, we have a shallow well, and then the deep well goes down to a 108. Um, again, that well was installed so we could pull more of the mass in if there was, was more, which there was when we drilled that well. We actually found some more soil vapor that we were able to pull uh, from the site. We installed the soil vapor probes, and those are shallow probes, 5 to 15. There's a 5 and a 15 feet uh, probe, and that's primarily for a, to monitor any potential soil vapor intrusion may be in the building, but we've eliminated um, any PC or any VOCs um, in that upper level of the soil. So those have been non-detect or whatever detections we have are, are very low, way below any, any screening standards. Next, uh, next couple slides are um, the concentration trends um, for, for the plumes. Um, this one is the East Plume, average PCE concentration trend. Uh, one thing I want to note is in 2018, around the time I took over the project, both for North Canal Plume and West Osborne Complex, um, I did a kind of a site-wide characterization, vertical characterization of the aquifer. So I deployed um, three passive samplers per well. I basically wanted to see where the, the, the majority of the mass of the VOCs were in the plume to get a good idea where the bulk of contamination was. So from about 2018 onward, um, all, we had some differences as far as um, where the PDVs have been deployed in the past, and so I wanted to get a nice accurate trend. You know, everything was, was mid-screen or where the bulk of the contamination was. And so if you were to draw a straight line, you'd see it's fluctuated, but you'd see overall a downward trend uh, in the East Plume, which is a bit of a success, I'd say. Uh, North Plume, same, same thing, around 2018 is when I, I did the vertical characterization with the three uh, passive samplers. Um, and it's, it's fluctuated up and down. It's, it's fairly constant, though, if you're to draw a straight line. Next slide. And then this is the West Plume uh, TCE. Um, seen a bit of a decrease, but you know, fairly constant in PCE concentrations. haven't fluctuated uh, too terribly much. Overall, the groundwater concentrations have remained fairly stable at least the last couple of years. We've seen a decreasing trend over the, the past two decades, but um, water tables, the water table has either increased slightly or it's remained the same. Um, again, showing that the plumes are stable. They really haven't changed since um, I took over as project manager in 2018. Uh, this slide shows the accumulated mass of PC removed from the SVE system in uh, the East Plume, an AC Custom Homes property. Um, this is where we installed the new blower. We were starting to flatten out a little bit. We got a little bit more mass, and then it got to be the point where we decided we should probably shut down and see if we can uh, see what rebound we have. We get to the point where we're just not going to remove a whole lot of mass from the subsurface now. Um, upcoming, upcoming and future activities will complete the record of decision. Don't know exactly when that's going to be. At earliest next year. Um, we've got several sites that are in the queue for review and issuance, so it's going to be a little time before the rod is issued. Um, once the rod is issued, we'll begin the preliminary steps to remedy implementation and continue monitoring activities. Um, right, that's okay. Um, right now, we're looking at, according to the proposed remedial action plan, is the main um, remedial action will be a soil vapor extraction for the soil in the Beto zone and groundwater monitoring. Um, but we also have a uh, some contingencies that we're looking at. Um, one is wellhead treatment, um, uh, replacing up to 15 shallow groundwater monitoring wells. As, as the trends have shown in the past, they'll likely go dry in the next next couple decades. Um, we have ISCO and 
potentially some pump and treat systems, three different uh, 50 GPM systems for each plume. And uh, that's going to be sorted out in the rod. And, uh, other than that, any questions? Oops. Nobody? Nobody. Wow. <laughs> Everything is clear. Very good. I'm glad to hear it. Next slide's a yeah. little less complex, I think. It might go a little quicker. What's the other complex? Yeah. You'll find some, sometimes I'll get my dates kind of flipped because, you know, working on these at the same time, we issued uh, rods and peer apps, or not rods, peer apps and, you know, around the same time, so. Rods will probably come out around the same time as well, so I'm sure I'll get those dates switched. Um, I won't talk much more on this slide. It's very similar to North Canal Plume. Differences remedial investigation um, was issued in 2005, so we've had a little more time on this site. Uh, FS was issued in uh, 2012. There are actually, uh, I believe, I think there were two FSs. There was for a shallow and a deep plume, um, which I'll, I'll talk about the two plumes as, as we go. Um, PRAP was issued in, uh, in 2020, uh, early 20, well, mid 2020, July, and right now we're at the rod phase. So the rod count. Much larger plume, much larger site. Um, I know this, this looks a little, it's kind of confusing, but these are, these are two separate plumes. This is the shallow plume. Uh, we call that the shallow groundwater system. And this, this is the deeper plume. Uh, we have a, the SRP Grand Canal. That's basically the northern barrier, or the northern boundary of the, of the wharf site, not barrier, boundary. Um, we have a, a McDowell Road here, I-10 runs south, 51st Avenue is here, and then we have uh, 30, 35th Avenue, um, right about where the eastern edge of the plume is. So, um, so contaminants concern is primarily TCE both in the shallow groundwater system and the lower sand and gravel subunit, um, or SGWS and LSGS for short. Uh, the, the shallow aquifer extends approximately from a, down to 200, 240 feet below the ground surface, so, so everything um, above 240 feet, that's part of the, the shallow unit. Lower sand and gravel subunit extends from 240 feet down, 240 feet below ground surface down to 400 feet below ground surface. Um, they're, they are two separate aquifers, two separate characteristics, but there's not what we call an aquifer. There's not a defining like clay layer, or you know, there's a layer of, of fines that separates the two. There can be a, some commingling in parts of the plume, um, but two distinct aquifers, two distinct plumes that we're looking at remedy. Uh, sourcing contamination, um, similar to North Canal plume, septic tanks and seepage pits uh, with former manufacturing facilities that operated, again, from the 1950s to the 1980s. And back media soil and groundwater. Uh, soil's already been taken care of. Um, there's an SD system that was operated near the main source area, which I'll talk about later. Uh, similar to North Canal Plume, uh, SRP and City Phoenix Municipal uh, water supply wells of the receptors. Uh, PRAP, as I said, was issued in uh, July 2020. The next milestone is brought. So a little bit more detail on this map. Um, I wanted to outline the main source areas. This is the West Osborne complex. Uh, divided up, there's several parcels, parcels here. Um, there were multiple manufacturers and uh, facilities that contributed to contamination. The deep plume was due to uh, an irrigation well. They called it the Pincus well, located right in the center of the plume. It provided a conduit for the shallow contamination to go down into the deeper aquifer, and then it just spread. The deeper aquifer is a lot of sands and gravels more conductive, higher um, velocity, so um, once the contamination was introduced into that shower plume, it, it spread fairly quickly. Um, probably it was uh, pulled by SRPUL 86.5 north, and that probably contributed to the, the migration of the plume. Um, oh, Oops, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Not quite done yet. <laughs> um, shower plume, we have another uh, source area that we're, we're investigating the, the PRP right now. Um, but we believe this is a, a source of contamination on the east part of the shallow plume. 
Um, City of Phoenix, uh, well, 70 and 71, those were shut down back in the 80s when the original, um, around the time the original investigation occurred. Um, and that's really what, uh, what sparked uh, investigation into this part of uh, West Central Phoenix and the contaminated wells. They shut the wells down, removed the pumps. SRP, well, 86.5 North is still fully operational. It's an impacted well. Um, 9.5 East, 7.7 .7 North is SRP well. It's been impacted in much lower concentrations. I believe they've all been below our quality standards, but we're still, it's still an impacted well. You can see where the groundwater flow direction is. Everything's going south towards uh, where the Salt River is. Right I think that's where you can go. That's about all I want to talk about. <laughs> um, for soil, um, soil vapor extraction was uh, operated as an early response action from 1999 to 2002. Um, that was led by uh, the PRP United Industrial at the time. They've actually merged now. They're, they, they sold to Textron, but um, they led the, the ERA. They also funded the remedial investigation feasibility study. Um, operated or operated uh, three years from 450 pounds of VOCs. They did uh, some shutdowns and pulse operations and determined you know, they were done to remove as much mass as they could. Uh, for groundwater, um, again, like North Canal Plume, it's just ongoing monitoring. Twice a year, we monitor West Osborne Complex at the same time that we do North Canal Plume. Uh, concentration trends. Um, Again, look at uh, 2018. In the shallow plume, we've seen overall a, a decreasing trend, uh, which is good. It shows plume stability. Um, plume boundaries, again, like North Canal Plume, they haven't they haven't moved uh, since I became the project manager. Actually, they've the, the boundaries have shrunk since I did uh, some more investigative work in the southern part of the shallow plume and delineated the west plume. So it's much it's much smaller than what we we thought it was. And then uh, deep plume concentrations are, are uh, significantly less, but clearly they're still above our quality standards. And concentrations really just haven't done a whole lot, They've fluctuated a little. Uh, so um, additional activities that need to be completed, complete the rod, like North Canal plume, begin preliminary steps to remedy implementation and continue monitoring activities. The uh, remedy, uh, stated that the PRAP is a hydraulic capture, a uh, small pump and treat system, about a 30 gallon per minute system that's going to be installed up in the north uh, part of the plume where the West Osborne complex is, and uh, groundwater monitoring. And there's contingencies for, again, wellhead treatment um, for either SRP or a City of Phoenix well. Um, well, either and, if both of them water treatment, there's budget for a uh, well that treatment for, for uh, both entities. We're looking at a possibly in situ chemical oxidation or ISCO for uh, either the central plume and that that uh, small source here on the east part of the plume, or both, and uh, monitoring well replacement similar to North Canal plume. West Osborne Complex, we're estimating about 20 wells will need to be replaced in the coming decades. And, uh, Looking at uh, maybe a well sleeve for um, one of the city of Phoenix wells, just to separate the well from the contaminated part of the aquifer. Um, we use city of Phoenix 157 as a sentinel well. It hasn't been impacted. Uh, we may um, look at putting a sleeve in that well just to el eliminate any possibility of further impacts. That's it for West Osborne Complex. Any questions, concerns? So the well replacement um, for this one and the other one, like, are you at the point where you need to start doing well replacements now, or are you, is it just kind of, they're getting low, and you know that in 5, 10, 15 years you'll have to replace them? Yeah, it, it's getting low. We tried to look in our crystal ball the best we could, yeah, yeah. just looking at historic trends. The good news is, is water levels have been steady in this part of, a, of Phoenix. Uh, I, I don't exactly know why that is, but they're, they're either steady or they've actually gone up a foot. So, I, I guess we'll see. We were projecting, when the PROC was prepared, um, you know, we we're still seeing steady decrease. We we're projecting in the next seven to ten years, we'd have to start replacing wells, and then another seven years, 
we have to replace some wells, and then finally around, I think, maybe the 20 year mark, um, you know, of course all the wells are, you know, they're screened kind of differently, you know, so the water table is going to, you know, measure differently in, in some of the wells, but nothing immediate. Okay. We have no plans immediately to replace any wells. Okay. Any other questions? time I'm presenting on this site to the CAF, so it's nice to meet everyone here. Um, so here we have the wharf process. We have went over this a few separate times. Um, the site made it onto the wharf registry in 1998. Um, record of decision was signed in 2020. So that puts us in the remedial implementation phase of the wharf process. And pretty much what we do in this phase is implement the remedial actions that were outlined as the selected remedy in the ROD. Next. So our contaminants of concern are chlorinated uh, uh, volatile organic compounds, um, CVOCs. The primary contaminant is PCE, uh, which is a result of um, releases at various uh, industrial facilities in the vicinity of the site. Currently, we have soil and groundwater that uh, require remedial action. So for soil, uh, the remedial action outlined in the record of decision was soil vapor extraction. Um, Eric touched on uh, pulsed operation and what that looks like, um, but essentially we transitioned to a pulsed operation in 2020. Uh, we have an SVE system installed at the FMB facility. Um, and with the pulsed operation, that essentially, um, as you mentioned, it, it has two components. You have an operational period and a rebound period. Right now, we're, we're in a rebound period, and we have a, uh, an operation period scheduled for the fall of 2023. Uh, currently, we're, we're on a schedule where we're operating the SV system for about a month, and we're turning it off for three months of rebound. And, and this, this will be an iterative process um, to optimize that operational and rebound period. So it's going to take some work on our end to kind of dial that in, and, and we will con continue to do that as the site progresses. The uh, name of the game is, is essentially to pull out as much mass as we can on as short a period as possible, um, or and or we don't have any rebound. Uh, so in 2021, in, in an effort to uh, accelerate remediation, we implemented a steam injection pilot study at the F&B property, and with that we uh, essentially injected some injected some steam into the subsurface, uh, hopefully hoping to liberate some of the contaminants that was absorbed onto the soil. Um, early results were positive. We had an increase in mass removal. Um, but throughout the, the overall period, the results were a little less conclusive. And that's likely due to the, the fact that we're, we're observing concentrations that allow us to be in that rebound period. Just, we don't have a lot of mass out there, um, as it appears. Good news is that we are in post operation. I, I think it's good news is that the record of decision called for seven years of continuous operation, and with the rec and with that being signed in 2020, um, us being in pulsed mode is, is pretty good. We're, we're a couple years ahead of schedule. No, I don't think so. So for groundwater, our remedial actions are um, enhanced reductive dechlorination and monitored natural attenuation. With enhanced reductive dechlorination, we have that program involves two types of injections. First, we have a biosimulation injection, which is where we introduce a substrate, a sucrose substrate, to create the right conditions, the reducing conditions. 
The second type is our bioaugmentation, where we're injecting microbes into the groundwater to facilitate that degradation. The program is coupled with routine groundwater performance monitoring that pretty much outlines the frequency of injections for us. It tells us when we need more substrate or when we need more microbes. Monitor natural attenuation is essentially uh, uh, it's, uh, captured under our annual groundwater monitoring. With the annual groundwater monitoring, we, we monitor the larger extent of the groundwater network. And with that, we're measuring groundwater elevations and taking VOC samples to basically um, determine groundwater flow direction and the extent of the bloom. No. I'm just kind of not sure. So speaking of extent of the plume, here we have a plume map that shows the outline of the plume. We have it, uh, or the footprint of the plume, we have it pretty well bound um, into this area. The lighter areas are where we're exceeding, I think, five uh, parts, per, parts per billion um, for PCE. That's, that's, our, that's our AWQS, our Aquifer Water Quality Standard, or cleanup criteria for PCE. And the darker areas where we have higher concentrations that exceed um, 100 uh, PPV, parts per billion. So here we have um, WCP237, a concentration versus time plot. And this is a well that's located on the F&B property, and it's, it's set right in between multiple ERD, enhanced reductive um, dechlorination treatment wells. And so kind of a brief recap on the, on the ERD process. I have a little figure here on the right-hand side. So th with this technology, the, the processes that we're anticipating are pretty straightforward. With, when PCE degrades, it creates a little bit of TCE, trichloroethylene, and as that degrades, it creates some more dichloroethylene, and it makes its way all the way down to ethene. And so with this figure, we see that in 2016, we implemented our, we began our ERD process. So it makes sense that we started seeing the uptick in those degradation products. Um, and that, that's what we're looking for when we're implementing this program to see whether the technology is working or not. Um, and what we can see is that the chemistry that we're anticipating is, is actually taking place. We had a pretty steady decline in concentrations from 2008 all the way to 2022. Um, and in 2023, we had a, an uptick in PC concentrations in this well. And I added in the blue lines, probably a little hard to see, but that line indicates when we went into the rebound period for soil vapor extraction. So one of the things that we're trying to answer this next fiscal year is, did that increase in concentration have to do, is it an anomalous reading? Is it, uh, is it uh, have something to do with our, our injection recipe? Or does it have to do with us shutting off the SVE system? So we're, we're coming up with a strategy to try to answer those questions um, to see if that has any uh, impact on how we operate our, our SVE system. Here we have GSC 44, which is a, it's a monitoring well located on the Glen Rosa Service Center property. And I wanted to show this, uh, this well, the concentration trend for this well, because this well for the last couple of years has been our, I guess our, our hot well, it's had the highest concentrations at the site. We can see that it's kind of steadily, steady been above uh, 1,000 parts per billion for, for all these years. And we started seeing the decline. In 20, it's not. This is a log scale, so it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to visualize. But that last, that drop off in 2023, um, the concentrations round are about 300 um, parts per billion, whereas the previous year was round or about a thousand. So that's a that's a pretty decent drop off. Um, that's something that we want to keep an eye on. This well, I showed the daughter products, but this well is about 150. Beat down gradient of ERD treatment wells, so it's not surprising that we haven't seen the response that we did in the other well that I showed. Um, if the concentrations continue to decrease, it's likely resulting from the ERD work that we're performing of gradient um, in our other treatment wells. But this is a well that we'll continue to, to keep an eye on um, for the in future. So activities for the next uh, 12 to 18 months, we're going to continue our pulsed uh, 
SDE operation, we'll continue the M&A program, and we're going to assess the ERD program that we've been implementing. And that's pretty much all I have for this site. I um, want to contact information there, but I definitely want to open up for any questions that you might have. No? All good? Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Michael. Can you flip the lights on on your way? Okay. So, just want to check and make sure again. Anybody have any questions or comments on the presentation? No? Okay. Okay. Um, normally, I included you in that as part of the public. So. Um, the next. <laughs> The next, uh, the, the remainder of the, the meeting is to discuss our, our CAP business. Um, uh, first is the meeting minutes from February 21. That was the last meeting we had. I don't know if you guys had a chance to review those. Um, does anybody have any questions or changes they want to make to those minutes? As far as I can remember from 2021. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it looked accurate. Yeah. Um, if you want to approve those and put them into the record, then I would need a motion and a second and then a vote from the three of you. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. I'll second the motion. All right. So all in favor of uh, approving the minutes from February 21? Just aye. say aye. aye. Rosa, are you okay with that? Aye. Okay. Aye. Yeah. All right. Minutes are approved. Okay, um, so I do have, now let me see if I can pull it out. Oh, I have it, I don't know if I have it. The cab charter. So we had a change in statute um, in the la since our last CAB meeting. So this actual statute, statute regarding community advisory boards was changed. Uh, it used to say that we had to have a minimum of four meetings per year. And as we've gone through time, we've realized that's not always practical because there's not enough data to meet four times a year. So now we really pushed to change the statute to say, hey, let's meet when we need to meet. So in the copies that I sent you of the, of the uh, Charter, what I'm proposing is that uh, we change um, section 4D, which used to say we will have meetings four times a year. The language that's there, I'll read it, it says, in response to site activities or a request from a CAB member or a city, town, or county in which the site is located, the CAB may meet with the department and any identified responsible parties to receive site briefings, progress reports, and other pertinent information. That's the language from the actual statute. So that's, that's where we got that. So basically it's just saying whenever you want a meeting or a city wants a meeting or anybody wants a meeting, you simply have to contact us, we'll set up a meeting. Now we, that doesn't mean we won't, we'll wait, you know, we'll wait for somebody to do that. We'll still set up meetings um, regularly. We're trying to make sure we have at least one per year there would be more if there's more to report to you. And then, of course, you guys get quarterly updates in the mail, email, you should, about what's going on at the site. So we're shooting for once a year. More than that would be in response to a request from somebody. So that's what that change means. Um, let's see, was there anything else? Oh, the only other thing I changed was Section 4I, I simply replaced a web link. Uh, it was, it needed to be cleaned up a little bit. Phone number and a web link, just to make it accurate. So the main change for the charter is simply the meeting thing. So do you guys have any questions on that? Or is there anything else you want to change in the charter? So if you approve that change, then we would need a motion and a second and a, and a vote again. I'll make a motion to approve the charter. Okay. Because 
Is that the show there? Yeah. All right. And then all in favor of say aye. Okay. So, charter is changed. And I will send you a copy of that. Now, the other thing we need to do as far as uh, the cab, the other vote we need to take if possible is once, a, once per year, which we've exceeded already, we're supposed to have a, a vote to re-elect chairpersons. Um, we can keep the same chairpersons, but we do have to have an official vote. There's only three of us here. <laughs> so we, it's just a procedural thing. We just need to take care of it. Um, it is anybody volunteering to be a co-chair for the next year or, or not want to be a co-chair? Do you want to be a co-chair? No, I don't mind. Because <laughs> I don't mind being one, but I don't want to do it. No, because I'm busy sometimes. And you yeah. know. Barbara, are you willing to stay? Yes. Okay. So we need a motion to elect Beth and Barbara to be co-chairs for the cap. And then a second. Somebody to say, I make a motion to keep the co-chairs the same. Can the co-chairs the co make that motion? Or? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Can I make a motion? Yeah. And then a second. Okay. And then all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question. Yes. So I gotta bring the people because I like I like the presentation that everybody is now the the screen is in two languages. Yes. So it's more easy for everyone to understand. And yep. Or sometimes the people, you know, the presentation is only in English, and the people don't have the deal what you say. So now the people understand what you say because the the right say, oh, it's an advantage. So I got to meet the people next time, next meeting. Yeah, great. And that's what I wanted to talk about. So, um, nor so one of the things that we discussed at the last meeting uh, was making sure that our meetings were hybrid, so both virtual and live. Unfortunately for this meeting tonight, we've had some changes going on. I wasn't able to do that, but from going forward, we can have a hybrid meeting. So we'll be online as well as here. Um, additionally, when we have it on, online, we're gonna have an interpreter here for anyone who has no English or doesn't communicate well in English. So they can ask questions and understand what's going on. So we will, we will have the interpreter. We will continue to publish everything in Spanish and English. If there's mistakes with that, Rosa, please let us know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because I'm not fluent. Um, and, uh, and we will do the hybrid meetings. Um, we, we do have a new director at the agency. And she has put a real emphasis on community engagement. So she really wants to push more community engagement um, across the state for, for everything that we do, not just wharf sites. So I have a lot to do right now with, with some CAB meetings, um, but I will get to a point, probably, I'll be honest, probably won't be after till after the new year. But for our CABs like this that have dwindled down to just a few people, I'm going to make a real effort to get out there and try to recruit new membership, get people interested, get people to attend online so they can hear what's going on. So I will be doing that. Um, because we definitely need it here. Uh, we do need a minimum of five, five members to the cab, which means we need three people at a meeting to vote. And really, we only have four. The fifth person is sort of out in the ether somewhere, We're just holding on to that. So. The other person who participated, David, um, is he reachable? He, he's reachable. Um, he lives in my area. Okay, he, he requested that he be communicated with via text, but I don't have that capability. So I let him know that and, you know, continue to send emails. He did respond to me in email, so I assume he's getting his emails. Um, but, yeah, if you ever see him, you know, let him know what's going on. But what I'm going to do after the first of the year is I'll reach out to you as well to see if you have any recommendations for me to where to look to 
you know, try to get people interested. Um, we might so have... The, I'm, I'm sorry. The mm -hmm. RES is at 27, McDowell, or Thomas, to the to Indian School? What is the specific uh, that people may be involved Oh, um, I don't think I have a full map of all four sides. Can you guys, somebody help me with that? Like, the boundaries? The extents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The is the farthest west, which is about 43rd, yeah, Mine goes a little yeah. past 51st Avenue. 51st yeah. Avenue. To? To what on the uh, east? East Grand. East Grand. East Grand. Yeah. And then south and north? South would be, uh, Between all the sites, yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. large, yeah. So if you guys have any suggestions over the next few months for me to, to get more people in, let me know. I won't be able to focus on it really fully probably until after the beginning of the year, but it is coming. So, and like I said, we're, we're hoping to hold meetings around once a year. So if we don't have any major changes, we'll probably hold a meeting next at the end of next summer. Um, but I will continue to send you the, the quarterly updates in the email. The last thing I wanted to address is, um, we talked about at the last meeting, at that time we had a new wharf site at 51st Avenue and Camelback Road. And we talked about possibly merging the community advisory boards. We can't actually do that because this, this the name of this board is West Central Phoenix, and part of that site is in the city of Glendale. So we, we can't merge the cabs. But I did bring the presentation that we did at the last board meeting for that site for you guys to take home if you like. It's not, it's not on the web, but our website is a little wonky right now. Um, so this will give you some information. <laughs> Have you seen I it? was actually going to ask Kim about that. Because I went to kind of brush up and I went to the website and I was like, I can't find the reports. I yeah. Yeah. Ross, I'm sorry. That one's not. Oh, no, no, it is. I think it is by the way. Um, yeah, I, I, at my level, we don't know why the website imploded, okay. but they're kind of rebuilding it. So is this intentional or? I, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I would say no, but, um, so it is going to be a little slow coming back. So if you need information about any other site, just call me or email me or any one of us here and we can get it to you. Okay. It's all still there. It's just, and it is on the website. It's just. Have no idea how long it's that's going to take this. So well, that's because that presentation I believe is from about a year ago, and at that time it was still a new site, so that was an estimation based on the data they had at that time. Since then, she's done a lot more sampling. The project manager has done a lot more sampling and investigation, but she hasn't given any other presentations about it. So um, the next time she does, that plume will look different. It'll be more focused to what it actually is. That was more of a guesstimate based on the data we have at that time. So I'm happy to, to forward you any information about that site, but we can't com combine it. So do you guys have any other questions about the cab itself or, or concerns or things you'd like to do differently?
Yeah, for sure. The, the, the schools. It's very important the school has Yeah. Yeah. When 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 I when I'm able to, we're gonna get more information out. Uh, to because the people that we reached out to before would have been so long ago they probably all turned over to all the people, you know. I know the owners living in the very close to now for forty nine. I know the owners because I I have uh, the meetings mm -hmm. coming up. Okay. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. So yeah, we're going to try every avenue. Um, we've done presentations at schools to the parents, you know, after school, uh, get, uh, about what's going on in their neighborhoods you know, environmentally. So it, it's, we're going to look at all avenues to try to get the word out because it has dwindled so much. So. Anything else? Um, I would say if there's anything as we go through time that you feel like you do want to talk about at a next meeting, just email me. Say, hey, I want to talk about this at the next meeting. I'll put it on, I'll make a note, I'll put it on the agenda. So, other questions or concerns from anybody? Now we kind of zipped through all this, but I uh, just want to make sure you get your questions answered. All right, I um, guess we need a motion to adjourn at 6.58 p.m. Can I hear a motion for that? <laughs> Second? Second, thank you. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Yeah. Aye. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, I'll take those. <laughs>